<clears throat> okay, well, welcome to the halfway point here. Um, last week we took a look at NumPy, which gives you uh, the ability to do uh, vector-oriented and matrix-oriented uh, arithmetic kinds of operations with uh, uh, very efficiently using uh, uh, numeric values. In this week, we're going to take a look at pandas, which gives you a little bit higher level kind of data type, uh, kind of a spreadsheet-like data type with uh, a matrix of data with uh, row labels and column labels. Anybody have any questions about anything before we get into this uh, new stuff? Okay, we will, as I hope you know, uh, have a quiz uh, at 8.15, correct? Yes. Um, and I cleverly forgot my, my, uh, my phone and don't have a watch, so if I get past 8.15 and I haven't shut up, uh, throw something at me and we'll do the quiz. <laughs> All right. So, pandas. Uh, pandas has two uh, data types that it offers. The first is a series, which gives you a sequence of values with labels associated with those values. You can think of a series as being like um, a sequence of transactions, let's say, or a time series where you have some data and each one of those values, each one of those data values has a label associated with it. The default labels are just zero through uh, one less than however many data items you have. To create a series, you can use the series construction function with any iterable uh, as an argument. And I guess even before we do that, in order to use uh, uh, pandas, we would typically say import pandas as PD. PD is the conventional abbreviation that almost everybody uses. Okay, so I'm going to import pandas, which is big, and my system is not fast. And... Come now. Good heavens, come on now. <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> it seemed like I had too many. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Okay, so pandas is now imported. And I can say uh, s1 gets pd.series and then any iterable that I would like to represent my data. And I'm just going to use a list of uh, integer values here. 3, 5, <coughs> 2, 4. And there we are. So <coughs> in my shell to display that series, I just type the name of the variable and uh, you can see the values in the uh, in the data column, and we have default labels over on the left hand side. Now, um, like ND arrays in NumPy, the items in a <coughs> column or a series in pandas all have the same data type. And in this case, the data type of these integers is in 64. Um, I'm not exactly sure why NumPy uses int32 by default, and Pandas seems to like to use int64 by default, but, but what the heck. Uh, now, an int64 <coughs> can contain values roughly between uh, plus and minus uh, 9 quintillion, I think. So it's not arbitrary precision, but it is still a pretty enormous range of values that you can fit into an int64. Okay, now you can ask, given a series, what its values are. 
and you can ask, given a series, what its index is. Um, and these are uh, sort of higher level uh, data types. They are themselves iterables. Uh, it's a little bit uncommon in a way that these are not methods that, that take parentheses. These are like the uh, endim uh, and shape uh, attributes that we had for ND array to find out what the number of dimensions of the ND array was um, and what the, you know, the tuple representing the shape of the ND array. Okay, now actually the, the values is itself an ND array. If I ask for the type of s1.values, I get told that it is an ND array. Um, and this ND array was explicitly set up with a data type of in64 rather than the default uh, in32. Range index is basically the same, <coughs> excuse me, basically the same kind of idea as our ordinary range function that we can use um, as an iterable for like for loops and creating lists and uh, tuples and so on. Um, <coughs> but it's built in, it's one of the built in objects within the uh, uh, the uh, the pandas module, the the series <coughs> and uh, data frame, uh, data frame, uh, data types. <coughs> okay. <coughs> if I want to have an index other than just the default sequence zero through n or zero through n minus one, I can specify what I want my index to be. So, if I say s two. Let me scoot this up a little bit so you can see it better. If I say S2 gets pd.series I don't really care what values I use. I can, in addition to specifying the values I want in the series, I can say index gets some sequence of values, a list in this case, and I'm using strings here, a, I just want to use consistent indexes here, excuse me, ax cap c question mark, okay, so ax cap c and question mark, and there we are, so now this series has the data, 5, 4, 9, and 7, but for indices, I've specified these string values. I can look up a particular item in a series using its index, whoops, sorry, using its index with a square bracket subscript. All right, so S1 looked like that. S1 sub 1 is the 5. S2 is that guy. S2 sub x is the 4. Okay. Uh, S2 sub question mark works fine. Question mark is a perfectly reasonable string. And it's the index that gives me back the, the value 7. Now, even though I have specified character strings as indices for the second series, S2, Pandas allows me to use integer subscripts anyway. So I, if I say s2 sub 0, I'll get the 5 back. And if I say s2 sub 3, I'll get the 7 uh, back. Okay, because even though these labels are given as strings, uh, Pandas is happy to allow me to use integers as an alternative. So far, so good. Okay. Now, if you have a dictionary sitting around, a dictionary consists of key value pairs. And you can build a series directly from a dictionary where the key is used as the label and the value is used as the, uh, the value associated with that label. So here I have a dictionary, D1 of stock tickers and prices. Now these prices I'm sure are you know way, way, way off. 
uh, but what we have here is D1 being a dictionary containing uh, X, which is uh, US Steel, so that's a uh, you know locally he headquartered company. In fact, uh, it's uh, it's the company that merged and bought and this and that, but originally Carnegie Steel actually. Uh, and here we've got Apple. 43 and Cisco I have a fixation on tech stuff I, I added X both as a nod to Pittsburgh and Andrew Carnegie but also because I it wasn't a tech stock <laughs> alright so here's my dictionary D1 and now I can create a series S3, I suspect, yes, S3 directly from that dictionary. Okay, so far so good? All right. <clears throat> now, just as you can test whether a certain value is in some collection, like a, a, a stir or a list or a tuple or a set or a, the list of dictionary keys, you can also test whether a particular key is a label in a series. So I ask what if X is in S3, I get told that's true. If I ask whether uh, international paper, to pick another non-tech stock is in S3, I get told that it's uh, not. Okay? We can do indexing, slicing, etc. using uh, a series just the way we can with an ND array. In fact, as I've, as I've shown you, uh, the data stored in this series um, is in fact an ND array. So it shouldn't be a big surprise that things that work for ND array uh, accessing and slicing works the same way. In fact, you can do uh, scalar arithmetic and vector arithmetic if I say s1 times 3 now this doesn't modify s1 but it but what it does is it computes a new ND array a new series I should say um, in which the values are the same as the values of s1 but multiplied by 3 <clears throat> okay so so this gives me a series containing 9 15 6 12 with the same labels as s1 I could have done a times gets if I did want to save that so if I say s1 times gets uh, 2 let's say uh, this did modify s1 so that the values are now twice what they originally were all right division as we would expect in Python produces a float so even though I'm saying uh, S, what am I doing here, S4, S4 gets S2, sorry, S1 divided by 2, yeah. So even though I'm dividing integers by integers, I'm still getting floating point results. And so this uh, S1 is not going to be changed, but S4 is going to contain floating point values representing 3, 5, 2, and 4. Right? Floor division of an int by an int will yield an int. So I started it out with s containing integer values, 3, 5, 2, and 4. I multiplied by integer 2, and now I am floor dividing by integer 2. And that gets me back to the original values that I created s1 using in the first place. 
Okay, so no big deal here. Uh, arithmetic works, and it works the same way that it does in uh, regular Python and in NumPy. All right, if I add two series together, this is like adding two ND arrays together. That is, you get a vector-oriented addition, uh, not a concatenation like you would get with lists or tuples. So here we have uh, a series that's only temporary because I didn't save that into a variable at all. Uh, 6, 10, 4, and 8 with the label 0, 1, 2, 3. But that didn't change S1, obviously. At least I hope that's obvious. Because the values in the series are in fact an ND array, you can use NumPy vectorized functions like square root on a series. And whoopsie. Okay, now this is interesting. Okay. <laughs> Uh, when I, way back at the beginning here, when I did my import of pandas, pandas uses NumPy internally. And so the pandas module did import the NumPy module. And that's why we were able to see things like the fact that the values part of a series is a NumPy ND array. But even though Pandas imported that module, it didn't import it using the abbreviation that I want. So I'm going to have to say import NumPy as NP to be able to say NP dot square root of S1. Okay, and, and that just, you know, it's calculated, it's displayed on the screen, other than that it disappears. Uh, I would have had to save that in a variable. If I wanted to have that information stick around. Everybody happy so far? Any questions? Okay. All right, so slicing works as you would expect. Um, if I say colon two, that means all of the uh, items in the series up to, but not including the sub two item. One colon means all the items from the sub one item to the end. All right, so here I've got my uh, S1 has four values in it, S1 sub colon 2 is only going to show the first two of those. S3 has three values in it with the uh, stock tickers as labels. S3 sub 1 colon only shows me everything except for U.S. Steel. Now, here is a place where the series notation uh, differs from the uh, ND array notation because you can use label names in a slice but if you use a label name if you use label names at the beginning and end of your slice like here I'm saying from Apple to Cisco this is actually going to include Cisco in the in the slice all right, when we use integer values, it, it means from this subscript up to, but not including that second subscript. But when I use label names, it means from this original label up to and including that uh, second label. So I'm going to get both Apple and Cisco uh, displayed out of S3 in this case. All right, so that's a you know strange little difference to, to be aware of. Now, also, it turns out that if the indexes between a couple of different slices are not matched, uh, do not completely match, and you do like an addition of those two series together, 
<clears throat> the places where a value exists in one but not the other all get filled in with not a number as the, the, the value. Okay, so here I'm going to create uh, another series, S6. S6 is going to be a series of three values. 371, 371, and as my index, I'm going to use a range index, but I don't want to go from 0 to, uh, to 2. I want to go from 2 to 5, uh, sorry, from 2 up to but not including 5. All right, so I've explicitly specified the range index that I want. The indexes for this series are going to be 2, 3, and 4. And, ah, you see what I forgot? <laughs> okay, so range index is not a top-level Python function. It's a facility of pandas, so I need to have my PD in the front there. And now I have S6. Okay, so S1 has four values with indexes 0 and 2, 3. S6 has three values, indexes 2, 3, 4. If I now compute, let me say S7 gets S1 plus S6, the values where the two series have the same indexes, those values are just going to be added up in the new series S7. But in places where the series labels don't match, um, I'm going to end up with not a numbers. Okay? So the only, the only uh, indexes in common between the series object S1 and the series object S6 are index 2 and index 3. Both series have index 2 and index 3. But only S1 has indexes 0 and 1 and only S6 has index 4. So those index values in the sum all end up being set to uh, not a number. Which is a valid floating point it, it is a valid floating point representation of something that's not valid. So I can actually create a variable. Uh, oh, x gets uh, probably np dot not a number. Yeah. So far, so good. OK, well, sometimes you do have a couple of different data sets that you would like to be able to compute the sum of. Like, for example, maybe you have, uh, maybe you have July sales figures for 500 customers. And you've got those things sorted with the, the customers' names as the labels. And then you also have August sales figures for those same customers. And what you'd like to do is to add those together to get the sum of July and August sales figures uh, for all of your customers. But in that case, you don't want, you know, if, if, if somebody came in and bought something in July but didn't buy anything in August, you, you just want to take that number that they had from July and add a zero to it, right? You don't want to get a not a number when you add those things together. So it turns out that we can, I'm skipping ahead a little bit here. Oh. Apparently I didn't plan to show you this thing that I'm going to show you now. <laughs> okay, um, so, or we'll, we'll probably see it later, but in any case, um, I have S7 which was created by saying S7 gets S1 plus S6. Um, what I can do is I can say S1 dot add 
S6. And notice that I can specify, ah. <laughs> I, I can't highlight it because the minute I try to highlight it, it'll go away. But notice that there's a, a keyword parameter there called fill value that I can specify. So I'm going to add S6 with a fill value of 0. So now, instead of getting all these not a numbers, I will get 0 as the default value uh, from the series where I don't happen to have that particular label. And let me call this guy S8 to differentiate it from S7. There we go. All right, so whereas, whereas S7, when I added S1 to S6, got a bunch of not a numbers for labels that were in one or the other, but not both, this time I get a sum where any missing value is treated as zero by default. All right, so that would work nicely for something like you know, if you wanted to compute quarterly sales figures for your customers, you could just take the, you know, the January, February, March sales figures, add them together with fill values of zero, and you would get a, a proper sum. Yeah. Ah. Okay. Good question. Let's check that. S1 is ints. S6 is ints. Interesting question. I had not noticed that. Um, it may be that the fill value is treated as floating point. Or maybe I said 0, 0.0. Did I say 0, 0.0 or did I say 0? No, I said fill value of 0. Yeah, so, right. So we're not even talking about fill values yet. We're, well, okay, okay. I mean, okay, I do know the answer to why S7 is floats and that is because not a number is a float and because we get this so-called upcasting uh, of converting simple data types into more complex types um, so I understand why we're getting float for S7 what I'm very confused about though is why we have floats for S8 when S1 is ints, S6 is ints, and my fill value is an int I guess we would have to uh, maybe read some code or look at some documentation to figure that out. Which let's not do that right now. <laughs> Other questions? Okay. <clears throat> okay. Now, if you have a big series of values and you think that there might be <clears throat> some not a number of values in there you can use the is null function uh, to test for any not a numbers and you'll get back true for each value that's not a number and false for each value that is a number um, <clears throat> you can invert this test by using not null instead of is null and instead of using null you can use uh, NA for not available so is NA is the same test as is null and not NA is the same test as not null okay so in our series S7 <coughs> If I've, if I've merged data sets together and I have a bunch of not a numbers as a result in my series, I can request 
the subseries that only has valid data by asking for S7 sub. And then effectively what I'm getting here is like a Boolean index, um, S7 dot not null. And I just get the part of the series where I don't have not a numbers as my part of my as my values. Okay, now I did this by all right. Um, I did this by specifying S7 as my current object and using the not null method. As an alternative, you can say you can execute the PD modules not null function with the object as an argument, but it works the same way. All right, so that's series. Now, a data frame is the other important data type in, in pandas, and a data frame is sort of like a spreadsheet. In effect, what a data frame is, is a collection of series where the series are like the columns in the data frame. And all of the rows in the data frame have the same labels. So it, it's like a collection of columns where all of those columns happen to have the same labels associated with them. We can easily create a data frame from a, a dictionary. The difference here is that although the key is used as the label, we need to have some kind of iterable <coughs> to provide the values in all of the uh, <coughs> rows associated with that. Uh, I'm sorry, I said this backwards. The, the ticker is the column name, in effect, and the values are the uh, <coughs> yes, yes, Ugh. yes. <laughs> so at some point, I think I said that correctly, but let me try again. Um, <coughs> so the, the keys are the column names, and then the values are the values in the rows in that column. And what what threw me off here for a moment was that I did not specify an index in here. So the index that I'm going to get in my data frame by default is just the integers, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3. Okay? So let me do this. Now, I'm, I'm much too lazy to type that in by hand. So I have <coughs> already stored that in a file. And I'll just copy and paste that guy. Okay, so there is my dictionary. Um, I have three columns, three keys, ticker, CEO by, and return percent. And notice that the iterables associated with these keys all have the same length. Okay, um, that's important because you should have the same number of rows in each column uh, in your uh, data frame. Um, I think what happens if you specify a, a co a, an iterable that has too many values Well, there's only two choices. I was going to say I think it's ignored, but it could it could be an error. I guess we should do a little experiment in a minute. Um, <clears throat> so there's my dictionary. Now let me create from that a data frame. F1 is my pandas data frame built from D2. And here's what F1 looks like. OK, so the labels are the default integers, 0, 1, 2, 3 because I didn't specify an index when I built this uh, data frame. And here are my columns. Each column is a series. And ticker, CEO by, and return percent are the, uh, the, the names of those uh, columns. So far, so good. Now, let me uh, explain what the meaning of this data set uh, is, because this isn't just totally random stuff. Um, one of the things that investors are uh, interested in is uh, 
attributes of the stocks that they're interested in either buying or not buying. And people spend all kinds of time analyzing things like the price of the stock, whether the price is going up or going down, whether the price is going up or down quickly, what the percentage return was over the course of the last year. And they're also interested often in uh, sort of human, human factor stuff like, has the CEO recently been buying the stock or not? All right, so here we have for, for ticker A, apparently the CEO of the company with ticker A uh, has been buying the stock. And so people might say, oh, well, that's a signal that, that the CEO expects the company to do well. That might be a stock I should be interested in, in buying. And in a real data set, you would have uh, multiple columns uh, with a combination of numerical scale values and, uh, and categorical uh, true-false values and so on. And you would try to run that through some kind of machine learning or regression algorithm to, to identify, oh, well, which stock should I buy? How much should I buy? This kind of thing. <sighs> Make sense, more or less? So that's what this uh, data set is a, is a very tiny little piece of. Uh, by the way, it turns out that knowing that the CEO is buying the stock is of no help at all. <laughs> it turns out that CEOs of companies are really bad at judging whether their stock price is going to go up or down. But if you discover that the, the chief financial officer, if you discover that the CFO is buying stock, that's a good indicator because CFOs are usually right. Um, selling, you can't really tell because a CFO might sell stock to buy an airplane. You know, because the C CFO wants an airplane. But if a CFO is buying stock, that's usually a pretty good indicator that the value of the stock is going to go up. Okay. <laughs> Um, all right, so we've got our small little fragment of a data frame built here, and we need to know how to access rows and columns and cells within this data frame. So I can access a column by using square brackets and the name of the column and what I will get from that is a series okay so F1 sub ticker is going to be the ticker series the indexes will still be uh, 0, 1, 2, 3 for that series um, and the values will be the ticker labels okay A, B, X, and G Um, same goes for CEO buy. I can say F1 sub quote CEO buy. And I'll get that series and so on. By the way, you'll notice that when I look up a column in a data frame, um, it is a series, but it has a name associated with it, which we're not used to seeing from the series we looked at originally. So if I look at S1, S1 is a series and it has values. There are labels associated with those values. There's a data type associated with those values. There's no name here, but I can create a name in a series if I want to by saying S1.name gets whatever, uh, I am S1. Okay, so by default, when you create an ordinary series, it doesn't have a name. But if you extract a series from a column in a data frame, then the name of the series that you extract is going to be the same as the column name in the uh, data frame by default. As an alternative, all right, here's my data frame F1. If the column name does not have any special characters in it. That is, if the column name could be used as a variable name, let's say, then you don't need to use the square brackets and the quotes. I can just say f1.ticker to get that ticker column. 
and I can say f1 dot CEO by to get that CEO by column but I can't say f1 dot return percent uh, because the percent sign here would not be legal as part of a variable name right it, it's uh, it's actually the the arithmetic modulus operator and so if I try to do this uh, pandas is going to yell at me you know invalid syntax so for this kinds of columns you do have to use the quotes and the square brackets to access okay so that's columns we can say f1 dot column name or f1 square bracket column name and we will get the, a series representing the column we can also get a series representing a row by using a row label to differentiate columns from rows it turns out that we need to use or we can use I should say uh, the dot loc uh, method uh, loc for location I guess um, all right if I say f1 dot loc to that will get me a series representing the row whose label is 2 and this time the labels are strings the values are uh, a string a bool and an int and because a nendy array requires all of its values to have the same data type and these d data types are so far apart that nd array can't figure out how to consolidate them nd array uh, numpy just throws up its hands and says okay i give up these are all objects <laughs> they're all the same data type they're all objects and I, other than that i'm not going to try to make them look like each other okay so we can access columns we can access rows now to receive to retrieve a cell sorry my pen keeps turning off here we go so if we want to access a particular cell uh, it turns out there's a number of ways we can go about this here's f1 and let's suppose let's see which one am I okay I'm trying to access this cell right here well one way I can access that cell is to first access the series for the CEO by column and within a series if I want to access a particular item within a series I just use its label as a subscript okay so here's one way of accessing that particular cell uh, containing false uh, f1 uh, dot CEO by that's all I want to do <laughs> f1 sub CEO by sub 2 will give me the CEO by column and then the item whose label is 2 the item whose index is 2 uh, in that uh, series now another way I can do it is to use loc and specify the row f1 dot loc and the row is 2 and then I can access the uh, CEO by item within that row since accessing things by row and column is such a common thing to want to do in in a spreadsheet like uh, collection of data uh, I can do that as an alternative to using two sets of square brackets so I, as an alternative to saying uh, f1 dot loc sub 2 sub CEO by I can just say f1 dot loc sub 2 comma 
CEO by. And that will also work. Okay, just to, you know, I just kind of wrote these whole things down and claimed that we were accessing this cell containing false. Um, let's build up to that uh, a step at a time. Here's F1. Here's F1 sub CEO by. And here's F1 sub CEO by sub 2. Okay, so this is CEO by, this column here, and sub 2 is going to be the sub 2 item within that series. Similarly, f1.loc2 is the second row, and CEO by is the label of the second item in that row, so f1, come on, f1.loc2 sub CEO by will get me there, and then most often people use the row comma column notation so remember to say dot loc and then row comma column and if you'd rather use just the position of the column rather than the name of the column you can also say f1 dot loc two comma one Oh, I'm sorry. No, that, that that won't fly. Okay. That that works with ordinary series, but not with not with accessing things out of a f not with accessing things out of a data frame. So pretend I didn't do that because it doesn't work. <laughs> uh, so far, so good. So we can access columns from a data frame. Using, uh, using the column name, we can access rows using the row index, and we can access individual cells either going by uh, column and row or by going by row and column. <clears throat> now, let's suppose that I want to add another column uh, to my data frame. Uh, I have decided that in addition to knowing whether the CEO is buying stock, and in addition to knowing what the last year's percentage return was, I also want to know what the so-called price-earnings ratio is uh, for the stock. Okay, So the price-earnings ratio, if that's something you haven't heard before, is the price of the stock divided by the dollars of earnings that, that the stock earned last year. Or if you're willing to live a little more dangerously, you might compute a price earnings ratio by taking the price of the stock and then making an assumption about what the company is going to earn next year. So you can have a backward looking or a forward looking uh, price earnings ratio. And right around 20 for historical reasons is considered to be a, a pretty high price earnings ratio. If, if, if you have to pay 20 bucks to get one dollar of income you know that's that's like a five percent return that's maybe you should just put your money in a bank <laughs> rather than buying a stock uh, if you have a PE that's that's up around 20 or higher but we're gonna just assume here by doing a scalar assignment that the PE of every one of these companies is uh, 20.5 now recall, here's F1, and recall how you can add a, an item to a dictionary. You say dictionary sub key gets value, right? Dictionary sub key gets value. We're going to do the same thing here. Data frame sub column All right, that column doesn't currently exist, but I can create it just like I can create a new item in a dictionary, and I'm going to use a scalar, addition, a scalar assignment here 
so that 20.5 is the PE for every one of my four stocks. All right, so I've added a new column, and I've used the same scalar value for all those things. So far, so good? If I would rather specify separate values for each of the four uh, stocks here, for each of the four rows, I can do that by giving an iterable that has four items in it. <clears throat> and what we're doing here is we're adding another piece of information to our table called the uh, peg ratio. <clears throat> okay, so I, I just claimed that, well, I just defined that the P-E ratio is the price of the stock divided by the uh, dollars of earnings that that stock uh, produces, the dollars of earnings that that company generates during the year. Now, and I, and I said that, you know, 20 for historical, you know, based on historical looks, 20 is on the high side of... Uh, of PE ratios. If, if the PE is that high, you know, maybe that's a stock that's kind of risky to buy. And people will come back and say, but wait a minute, but wait a minute, but wait a minute, Uber, but wait a minute, Amazon, but wait a minute. <laughs> There's all these examples of stocks that have these gigantic PE ratios. In fact, Amazon's PE ratio for a long, long, long time was negative because you would have to pay hundreds of dollars for the stock and it lost money every single year. <laughs> so people say, but wait a minute, the price earnings ratio doesn't matter. It's the price earnings ratio relative to how fast the company is growing that really matters. So if you've got a high PE ratio, that doesn't matter if the company is doubling its revenue every single year. And that's called the PEG ratio, the price earnings to growth ratio and so we're going to say for our stocks these are uh, 1.7 uh, 0 0.9 2 .2, 1.1 2.2 1.1 and so we're going to get a new column added to our data frame and rather than the scalar value 20.5 we're going to specify the individual values that we want for each of those rows Okay, and so now we can look at this additional piece of information that we have, <coughs> you know, that we have hired some cost-free intern to go out and gather this information for us. Um, <laughs> we're, we, we add this information to our data set and we say, oh, well, wait, uh, stock B has a P-E ratio of 20.5, stock X has a uh, P-E ratio of 20.5, so on a pure PE basis, those look kind of similar. But wait a minute, X, X is growing more than twice as fast as B is growing. Hmm, so X looks a lot better than B if I'm thinking of buying stocks. Anyway, so, uh, so we've shown a couple of different ways of adding columns to the data frame. Make sense? Now, you can get rid of a column from a data frame using the delete or the del. Uh, I'm never sure what to call this thing. Facility, it's not a function because you just say del in a space. Um, it's, it's, you know, it, it's, it's a built-in operation. So del of F1 sub P.E. I, I, I'm going to decide that P.E.s aren't that interesting to me, so I'm going to just delete that whole column. But I like the peg ratio idea, so I'll keep that hanging around. So we've seen how to add columns by just saying data frame sub new column name gets either a scalar value or an iterable. Now we're going to, and, and we've seen how to delete a column, now we're going to take a look at how to add a row and how to delete a row. Adding a row is as easy as adding a column. You just have to remember to use lock. 
lock for location. So f1 dot loc uh, sub four. All right, my current row labels are zero, one, two, three. I'm going to add another row here called four, and I'm going to fill in uh, z as my ticker. True, okay, Z's CEO is buying stock. The return is 8.2, and the peg ratio is 1.3. And I have now successfully added a new row uh, to my data frame. Now, one might think, well, we can just say del of f1.loc4 to get rid of that row that we just added. But no, it's not that easy. You have to use the drop method to get rid of a row from a data frame. This is not my fault. I did not design this. But there you go. So you can add a row, um, but then you have to drop the row in order to get rid of the row. Now, the, the, the one that I skipped over here, slide 26, let me back up for just a second, and we'll take a look at that. Um, each of these columns, including the label column, has a data type associated with it. So the label column is integers. The ticker column is strings. The CEO by column is booleans. And then the return percent and peg ratio, those are all floats. If I do something like adding a row whose, uh, whose label is not an integer, and I use a scalar value to specify 12 as the values for all of these things, uh, now I'm going to have a label of 0 0.5, 12 is going to be treated as a string just fine. But when I try to put 12 into a column of Booleans, uh, everything is going to be upcast to integers. And the trues are all going to be, be turned into integer ones, and the falses are all going to be turned into integer zeros, which is really probably not what I wanted to happen. But the data frame doesn't ask me, you know, hey, are you serious? You're, gonna, you're about to shoot yourself in the foot. Do you really want to do this? No, it's just going to happen. Um, and then for the return percent and the peg ratio, that's fine. We'll just convert the integer 12 into floats and everything's happy. So here's what we have now for uh, F1. All of our labels have been turned into floats now. Um, our ticker is the string 12, that's fine. But notice what's happened to our booleans. Now I have zeros and ones instead of uh, trues and falses. Uh, and this is a problem. Now, at this point, I notice I've made a dumb mistake. So I want to say f1.drop that row that I just added by mistake. And unfortunately, that doesn't really solve my problem. Because once you've done the upcast, the upcast doesn't get undone by just removing that row that you made the mistake with. So how do you handle this? Just don't make any mistakes, and you'll be all set. <laughs> all right? <laughs> now, another thing I want you to notice here is that when you do a drop, um, that doesn't actually drop the row in the data set. What it does is to give you back, an, I'm sorry, in the data frame. What it does is it gives you back a new copy of a data frame with that particular row missing. All right, so I said f1.drop 0.5. That didn't actually change f1. f1 still has 0.5 in it. So if I want f1 to no longer have 0.5, I need to say f1 gets f1.drop 0.5. And so now f1 is referring to this data frame that has that row dropped. All 
All right, so we've looked at how to create data frames. We've looked at how to specify labels for data frames. We've looked at how to access entire columns of data frames or entire rows of data frames or individual cells within data frames. And we've seen how to add columns and delete columns and also how to add rows and delete rows. So we've done the kind of basic high level uh, management of stuff on our data frame up to this point. So far so good? Okay, well it's just a little after seven, so let us take a 10 minute break and then we'll get back and then uh, and then we'll have about one more hour and then the quiz will start.